We've got Josh Davies joined with us with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. Um, he's been in, his, in this role since July of 2018, and he provides oversight on the State Hazard Mitigation Plan, Grants Management, and Key Strategic Initiatives, which we'll be talking about a little bit. Prior, uh, Josh served as the County Executive over Emergency Services with Travis County um, within Texas, and was also an EMS Section Chief uh, for the County of San Santa Clara in California and as command staff for the State of California Emergency Meg Medical Services Authority. So a lot of background in the emergency services, uh, now working in the mitigation space. So with that, I'd like to introduce Josh. Thank you, Josh. Hurricane Harvey and understanding some of the changes that have been made um, in Texas kind of since Hurricane Harvey and also prior. So Very good. appreciate you joining us. You're welcome. This is a great um, event and I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but just in September of last year, uh, Texas Division of Emergency Management joined with A&M. So this is one of the many forums that we have together and we're really recognizing the benefits already of, of things like this, bringing together academia and the profession and science all in one one place, so thank you for letting us be here. Yeah, thank you for hosting us. It's been excellent so far. So to, just to get started, can you tell us a little bit about your career in emergency services and emergency management, and how has that led to your role as a division chief and really overseeing a lot of the mitigation efforts within Texas? Sure, so I've been involved in emergency management for about 30 years. Um, I started in high school, I worked as an emergency medical technician on a private ambulance and then became a volunteer firefighter. And that led to a full-time career in the fire service. Uh, after a few years, I started teaching at the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA, um, in emergency management there. <laughs> I'm not allowed to respond to that because we're associated with Texas A&M, so I appreciate <laughs> your interest in UCLA. Uh, <laughs> there, there might be a Bruin involved, yes. Um, so in that, in that role was, was really the foundation of me starting um, to move out of the fire service and out of the traditional responder role and more into the planning phase. That's what um, my role at UCLA was, was to design systems for uh, various jurisdictions that put together the different pieces of emergency management. Still primarily in medical care, but um, it, was, it was a departure from the traditional response piece. After that, I left the country and went overseas and I worked in Italy doing satellite telemedicine and uh, about 1995, and back then your webcam was the size of a refrigerator that actually took six or seven people to move a device uh, and aim it in the right direction and potentially hit a satellite and send it back from Italy to Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. Um, that was an awesome time to be involved in that type of profession and that type of industry. And then after I returned, I became really my administrative uh, life in emergency management in um, overseeing emergency medical services in Ventura County, California. And then more recently, I moved up to the San Francisco Bay Area and was the EMS section chief there for the emergency medical services system for a little over 15 years. And that brought things like the Super Bowl, which uh, have any of you hosted a Super Bowl in your jurisdiction? Uh, don't. Um, <laughs> it's, it sounds like a great thing to have, but it's a tremendous amount of work, and if ever you want to introduce yourself to federal partners, uh, it's quite an exploration and understanding roles, but um, great experience, but a lot of things happened in that role. And then several years ago, I moved to Texas to work uh, pretty close here up in the Austin area in Travis County in a uh, county executive role. Uh, overseeing emergency services, and then I've been with the Texas Division of, of Emergency Management for about a year. Um, my current role is as Division Chief for Mitigation, which also includes some other um, programs as well, but one of the ones that ties together well with mitigation is our quality assurance function, which is really applying science to this role again and going back and checking and seeing if things do make a difference or if we're just simply doing something to do it. This way we take a look at it and see ways that we could realize improvement. Uh, last piece, I am a certified emergency manager. I've been one for about 15 years, and I still do maintain a paramedic license um, for about 28 years. Great, excellent. So, you know, this, this talk is about shifting that paradigm kind of in the role of mit uh, mitigation following Hurricane Harvey, but I think just even in terms of your career, you've made that shift from focusing in response to focusing in mitigation, but still maintaining your currency as a responder as well. Right, right. Kind of what's your rationale behind that? 
<laughs> there is no rest. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, starting early on in the fire service and in the ambulance business, uh, at that time I, th I thought that my career would be spent there. That would be doing the traditional promotion path, um, promoting from a, a firefighter paramedic to an engineer, captain, battalion chief, and up the ranks. And pretty quickly, uh, honestly, I became bored, and that was really me. It wasn't the organization I worked for or the work that was there. It was really challenging, but I found I needed 10 things on my plate at a time, and that's where I started the departure into emergency management. And one of the things I really never understood is why EMS isn't really considered in emergency management by many people. As a matter of fact, my first year in IAM, when I went for my CEM, um, there was a lot of resistance, and it was formal resistance that, hey, that's not part of it. Well, one of the key messages I think you'll get out of today is what we're missing are partners and collaborators. And closing the door on anybody coming to the table, especially in mitigation and in policy and in emergency management, is just a mistake. Everybody brings a different perspective and a different way that we can look at things, and that's kind of what I experienced early on in my career, and I just started finding different avenues as mm -hmm. things progressed. Also, the Northridge earthquake in Los Angeles, um, I was a firefighter paramedic during that time, and if you ever want to really feel the impacts of uh, what mitigation can do, you travel down the street, you look at an area that had a certain type of plan in place and an area that didn't, and you can see the night and day difference. Um, so from very early on, emergency management it, is entwined with the response piece. Yeah, thank you. I think it's an important perspective. We've been talking about that since this morning, so. Right, and you know, I, how many in here are responders? And how many of you are mitigators? That's not true. There's like <laughs> six or seven of you who say that. That's <laughs> absolutely not true. Um, so one of the things I think that we need to think about is everyone's familiar with the four or five components of emergency management, depending on who you ask. Let's stick with four for today. So there's four. Um, they're not linear. So the idea we have is that you do preparedness and you do response, right? Well, I think we have to think of these as, as happening all at the same time, but yet they have very different timelines and, and lifespans on them. So for example, response lasts seconds, minutes, maybe hours, sometimes maybe days, but the recovery and the mitigation piece lasts, what do you think? It's not years, years, decades, lifetimes, and generations. And is that an extreme statement? No. Think about one of the earliest forms of mitigation people think of is dams, right? The Tennessee Valley Water Authority, right? You put a dam in, generations were impacted by that change. <coughs> Any public health colleagues in here? So in public health, one of the primary focuses is focusing on upstream changes. So changing diet, changing exercise habits, changing a built environment, which is also mitigation, changes what life is like 20 or 30 years from now and next generations of children. That's going to be the challenge in mitigation because depending on where you are, you probably have term limits. You probably have some politics involved in your jurisdiction. What you have to do has to survive several generations of people who are your decision makers to keep you on the right path. And to vision down the road 10 or 15 years or more is often hard for an elected official because it's not in their portfolio for that period of time. The, the odds are against us in mitigation. It's not like response where we can quickly go to a scene. As a responder, you know what to do. You've practiced it before and if you didn't, something similar has happened before and you're used to a rapid sequence of decision making. You get enough information to make a decision, and unlike mitigation or other areas, you're not done, right? In emergency response, you keep assessing and making the decision over and over and over and over and over again until it's good enough, safe enough to go on to the next step. In mitigation, you better build the dam right. You better make sure the road was properly constructed to account for new construction that's happening and new building methodologies and it's a different set of challenges. Yeah, no, thank you, that's, that's actually, it, that's right on in terms of where we're looking at things. It's not just about can you innovate and create a fancy new widget and new application, it's how do you kind of shift to, into a culture of innovation and institutionalize that change right. so that it kind of continues to perpetuate itself you know, past political tenures and, right. and, and it's not personality driven right. at the end of the day. Right. So. Exactly.
So I, I want to shift a little bit in talking about Hurricane Harvey and kind of the role of mitigation following, I think, what everybody knows as Harvey, but obviously Texas has experienced many more. We're in the anniversary of Hurricane Ike mm -hmm. um, currently. And so kind of in light of these large disasters, and in particular, you know, Harvey being quite paramount, um, you know, why was it so different? What, <coughs> what is it that made this particular incident different that within Texas and beyond? Sure. So how many of you are Texans here? Okay, so you're used to hurricanes, right? This isn't a new thing for us to have a hurricane in Texas. Um, and certainly that is even part of our mitigation and our recovery and our prevention strategy is we're used to it. So what made Harvey so different? Well, it was huge. It was massive and it was slow moving. And with its slow moving nature, there came a lot of water. And so the flooding threat was bigger than one might expect from winds and other hazards that come out of Harvey. But Texas had also has a long history of having damage from hurricanes over and over. And since Harvey, we've had uh, hurricanes since. What was different about this, I think, is that Governor Abbott, the governor of Texas at the time, uh, early on in the disaster identified that Texas is gonna have hurricanes again. Let's start to look at this and study it early. Let's figure out some lessons learned. And he charged uh, Chancellor Sharp with the a and system to really start to look at what was happening and to build a report and lay out ways that we can strengthen our response systems. But more importantly, how do we look at recovery and mitigation um, for Hurricane Harvey and for the future? What are things we as a state can do, not just as a single organization or not just as an after action following Harvey, but how can we strengthen and invest in Texas as a whole to make it more resilient? That's great. And, and, and I think it's interesting because one of the things that came out was the, the report, the Eye of the Storm, which uh, Dr. Brody started to talk very briefly about this morning. And in that report, it led to about 44 different recommendations. And can you tell us more about kind of the, the commission and how that report came to be? Sure, so I think one of the unique things, do we have that report handy? We'll put that up. <laughs> we don't. We'll um, there we go. There we so go. one of the unique things is uh, if you work in emergency management in a state, you might be um, used to a couple bills headed your way in a session or per year, depending on how you do it. In Texas, uh, every other year our legislature goes in, into session. And out of the recommendations that came out of the assessment that I talked about, that the Governor had tasked Chancellor Sharp with, <coughs> excuse me, um, 43 of the 44 recommendations appeared in legislation. That's phenomenal. So a, a report that was written by an academic institution that integrated with responders and emergency managers to build the report, translated into law is pretty amazing. Um, obviously the challenge here is uh, we have a lot of work to do. So there's a tremendous amount of work that came out of it. And I think this is a great infographic, especially at the bottom where it breaks down the different types of areas that the legislation uh, focuses on. And it's very broad and it's very uh, much integrated. One of the big changes that happened is recommendation number 43, which is the one that wasn't part of legislation. And that one is probably one of the most fundamental pieces of our today and our future and the success of implementing all of them, which was bring other institutions into our emergency management council. And our emergency management council is who operates our state operations center. These are the agency representatives who have the authority and the financial ability to commit their resources across the state. The big piece that we brought in was academia. We brought in the Texas education systems, which there isn't one or two, there are many. And that beefed up the amount of people who can provide subject matter expertise and things, resources, communication links into it. And so uh, that one itself is critical to the rest of these because it brings us into different communication lines that we didn't have before. And if you look at the bottom, it's so diverse, you need other people with you to help guide you into these different steps and how to be successful there. We don't need to be the masters in each of these areas, but we need to figure out ways to penetrate into those environments and then to bring the information back out in a, in a comprehensive way that we could package. Thank you. And I think one of the things that you and I had talked about earlier is just the fact that the different 
areas that the different pieces of legislation and bills affect is, is really diverse. Um, it's not like there's any one particular silver bullet that's going to solve everything. You need changes that are fairly sweeping across right. communications, planning, agency coordination, disaster services, mitigation, technology and data, training, um, kind of to make that all happen. Right, right, exactly. And I think the challenge is that uh, many of these items are um, placeholders or seeds to discussions or initiatives that are going to take many years to accomplish. Um, certainly we need to see progress and growth in a short period of time within the first couple years or so. But some of these are, are massive, so I'll give you an example of one of those. Um, how many of you have worked with FEMA before? Okay, so the grant process is really easy, correct? <laughs> okay, that's proof that you've worked in the grant program. So the idea was that would it be possible for Texans to go to one place to apply for all sources of FEMA grants and or associated federal funding opportunities that would come with a disaster? And so from one perspective, um, you know, most people would say that's impossible. Well, we'll see where we get with it. But the intent is, uh, if we reverse engineer it and we look at things a little bit differently and we start on the Texas side of the house and we figure out what data we collect and who our partners are and how we put our data into different systems, we may be able to find an interface or a crosswalk to maybe we don't buy the Cadillac, but maybe we're able to start out with a, a smaller vessel first and build up as we go or even if two grants populate, that's two better than happened today. So the goal isn't to go in into two years think that we can change something that happened forever, especially when we're talking about, in some cases, law, and in some cases, policy that's at the federal level is very difficult. But um, the idea here is that it's very visionary and that we can take pieces at a time and then reassess and, and go on to any next steps. It, it, it's definitely very progressive in terms of seeing this level of change at a legislative um, perspective in such a short period of time. I, I want to talk a little bit about kind of this concept of resilience because let's be realistic, it's one of the most elusive terms out there. Resilience is a big buzzword. I was reluctant to coin this event with the term re resilience in it. I think we know what preparedness is. It's a little bit more grounded. But, I mean, when you look at the progress that's been made through the eye of the storm and the subsequent policy changes, how do you think that's actually going to make and affect resilience in Texas? Like, what's going to be the impact of that from your perspective? The answer that I want to say, say, but I'll correct quickly, is I have no clue. I have no idea. Um, and that's part of the beauty of the recommendations, is that if we had quick fixes to 44 questions, and these are just 44 recommendations that are filled with lots of problems, and you know, problems have answers, and so we have a certain set that we'll be able to come up with answers for, like the single application example of that. There's certain things that are out there, and we can align them, and, and we'll see how far we get in that path. Other of the 44 recommendations represent issues that are dilemmas where there's just not an answer. There's not any best way to fix it, and it's kind of recognized that this is a really difficult problem and how to package it. Um, no matter what, the resilience that we do realize out of this is that we had an academic institution working with responders, working with Chief Kidd and the Texas Division of Emergency Management and all of our local jurisdictional partners during the event. This wasn't a retrospective review. Mm -hmm. This is. The event is still happening and it's being assessed and compiled. And then mixing it with science and a, a lot of the recommendations that you go into here, um, this isn't just good ideas, we have to make sure they're good ideas. We have to make sure they're a good idea for the investment if there's dollars behind it or time that's behind it. All of that equals resilience in the form of building champions. And so in this case, uh, we have champions in the legislature because they signed off on over 40 recommendations related to emergency management for a near-term project. What's scary up there is you'll see that once some of the legislation passed, some of it was immediately um, in play, it was immediately executed. Others had a couple months, and at the longest stretch, we have until 2020, which is around the corner. It's a very quick process to get things going. So what it did is it made whole communities much more aware of what's happening and how they, get, how they can get involved in different aspects of the work that we're already doing. We saw new partners coming to the table that 
were always out there and looking for a place. Now they have a place. They can find a home in one of the um, committee meetings we have, one of the advisory groups, or just even as a member of our local jurisdictions who's providing information to us. Everybody knows in planning, the effort is in the planning phase. It's not in the document that you create, right? You still are going back to checklists. You're still going back to what you know how to do. But at the end of the day, that planning effort is what really is strengthening um, communities. And in this case, we start with our local jurisdictions, but it strengthens the state of Texas as a whole. Interesting. Thank you. And I think it's also a good segue. You started to talk a little bit about the coordination and collaboration with the academic community. Yes. And so what do you see as the role for kind of the scientific uh, and technology community in this effort of, you know, should we say implementing these 31 different bills and pieces of legislation and, and kind of making it real within Texas toward higher sure. levels of resilience? Sure. So our profession collectively as emergency managers is really in civil defense and came at a time when there was um, a very specific threat to which we were trying to make ourselves more resilient to. And since that time, along the way, academia and science has blended in, but in many cases they were in two different camps, that academia was viewed as uh, their great thoughts and ideas, but these cannot be practically placed in the emergency management field. And some of that's true today. And you have the battle of the academic versus the practical person, right? You even have people calling themselves pragademics now who practice the practical application <laughs> of academics and what have you. Um, is Dr. Brody here? Yes, he's right there. That's a pragademic. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Brody is a fine example of how we blend this together. Um, the first trait that Dr. Brody has. Do you all know Dr. Brody, by the way? You should. No. If not, he's one of our partners here with the Texas A&M, and he has done some incredible uh, development of tools that we have, but one of the ones in particular is Buyer Beware, and this product is a great example that is built for an individual to check and see what the impact is to their house uh, on flooding or to their environment and flooding in that area, and it works in such a way where it's intuitive. It doesn't take a manual to figure it out, and um, it's an average everyday person's application. I say that because a lot of the academic involvement that we've had in emergency management has been way beyond our interest or our capability as first responders, and I speak for me, right? So maybe many of you are much more attuned to that. Um, one of our other partners here, Country, is over here, and we were just having a conversation earlier, and it, it's much to the same point, which is that an academic solution often is too big for us. So much like GIS applications or other information technologies, uh, one of the things we were just chatting about was one of the first things you do is turn off all the extra features that something has and you get back to what it was, right? Or you just go for the first time to a response or to an event that was all about what you just did the planning to and as soon as you get there, you're like, mm, nope, going back to what it was before. Examples like Dr. Brody's is one where we can implement right away. It doesn't take much thought. I don't have to convince anyone to do it. The return on investment's pretty clear. I can look at my house and I can see what happens as a result of flooding that happens in that area. So I think the true investment of the two cultures coming together is what's necessary. Academia has always been involved in emergency management, as has science, but they still operate in the silos. One of the very cool things that we did fairly recently was we met with uh, masters and undergraduate students in A&M who are doing research in emergency management, uh, particularly in mitigation. And they brought all their ideas there. And to no surprise, some were way out of our league and even understanding the concept of where they were going about circles and zeros, and that's the same thing, actually. But you get my point. <laughs> and other things were very practical. Um, and many different things that come together where you can take a practitioner or a responder and take all these pieces and maybe get together with that researcher or a group of them and refine it and blend it into a different type of message. That is something that can actually be actionable. You can search today on whatever your research uh, you know, sources that you go to look at your literature and you can find lots of things that are published but you can't find a lot of them that are ready to go and you need the championship and the partnerships that I talked about before. So bringing everybody together constantly, including students who don't know yet what is possible and what's not possible is really critical to this mitigation piece. 
I appreciate that. There's a couple key things that you touched on here. It's kind of that, that human-centered design mm -hmm. process. And I know one thing that we've run into time and time again that kind of goes with this evolution that we've seen in terms of the use of technology and GIS in particular um, during disasters is we tend to try to put everything onto the map, realizing that, that everything is just too much and you wind up in what I call analysis paralysis, and then you're like, I can't use any of it, right? right? So it renders it all useless if we don't really dive down into what you need. Um, and I think it's a nice connection with the academic and scientific community to, to help. They, they know the wicked problem and they have the wicked solution, but how do you get into something that's truly practical? So right, and you take a, a place like Texas. We have 254 counties in Texas, and there are 254 counties in Texas that are nothing like the rest of them. Yeah. And take your state, take your county and break it into cities or local municipalities or school districts, however you want to break it. Everybody is different. And so when you come up with this awesome solution, you also have to de-engineer it, deconstruct it, to find a way that it's gonna work for the local community that perhaps has a police officer who is the emergency manager, who is the firefighter, who is the on and ten, does 10 different jobs, all the way up to a massive jurisdiction that has full-time people in all of these roles. So that becomes a challenge as well. And we wanna make sure that we don't engineer solutions to those who have the ability and capabilities, but that we're able to come up with mitigation strategies and solutions that can be done by one person shows in very small jurisdictions as well. So we're gonna shift a little bit and talking about one of my favorite topics, uh, which is how we measure success. And this morning we talked a little bit about what if we started to reframe success instead around how many lives did I save by pulling people out of a disaster and how many homes did I get grants out to and public assistance to saying, oh, I, I implemented these mitigation efforts and measures and as a result, I protected all of these people and these pieces of infrastructure from damage that they would have otherwise faced. So it's one way that we're starting to needing to shift that dialogue. So you know, in your different roles, how are you now looking at measuring success in Texas? How many firefighters? So when you save a building, you save <clears throat> whatever that may be, how do you categorize that? What do you say? When you go to a building and you successfully extinguish it, say it's a single room and contents fire, what is your measure of success? What do you say? What's left, right? Um, or often we say there was this many millions of dollars in damage, right? or we stopped it from getting to the neighboring business, right? So quantifying the negative is um, a different approach to how we report our successes. And some people will say quantifying the negative is um, a bit like being a used car salesman, where you're saying, yeah, don't look at the car, but look at everything else uh, about it and what your life would be like if you had this you know, car that I'm trying to sell you. So the point is that if you take the same example of the fire service and suppressing a fire, what you would say is, as a result of suppressing this fire, we don't talk about numbers on the building that was on fire, but we say we stopped losing five million in this business next door, six million in this, this much in infrastructure, this much in environmental impact, and you calculate that way. And so some people think that's you know skirting around answering the question, but it really isn't because um, for many, even the fire service know that large box stores, large chain stores, often if there's a structure fire in it today, that that business, a business like McDonald's or Burger King or large chains, has already calculated the value of that structure and the value of rebuilding the structure or not in that location or a different location. When you quantify the negative and you look at the, the built environment that's around it, what could happen with the neighborhood, it puts a different perspective on what you might wanna do there. So for example, applying it to flooding and disaster and hurricanes. We know areas that are gonna be hit over and over and over again. And many of the sources of funding that we have actually encourage people to rebuild in many ways, mm -hmm. right? It's to restore a structure back to only their original way that it was before a disaster. That doesn't help us, but if we keep that in mind and we look at other things that will improve as a result of doing things differently there, we can try to redesign that project a little bit differently. It's more complex, but the focus is not on the loss, but the focus needs to be on what we protected and what we can prevent and build in the future. Thanks, that's definitely 
definitely paradigm shifting in terms of where we've been. It so. is, and it, it, feels, it feels funny, right? It, it feels um, like I say, yeah, great, the, the house is a total loss, but really look over here and look at how nice the Costco is that wasn't burned at all. Um, it's a balance of the two, and this is why it's the whole emergency management continuum, that you still have to have the response piece and you still have to do what you're charged to do with the suppress fire and save property and save environment. But at the same time, uh, in the bigger sp perspective, again, you're looking downrange. You're looking 10, 15, 20 years again, lifetimes and generations to see mm. a, a positive change. And just like today, you have to implement plans for response and, and there's no replacing that. You have to have that in place. You have to practice it and you have to have events to use it to get better and to be more refined. But what we have to do too is start mitigation way before there's any disaster, way before there's any thought of any funding uh, ability or way before it's required by codes. It has to be in our minds very early on and then built into the preparedness piece and the response piece and all the other aspects that feed into our core components of emergency management. Yeah, interesting. So I have one question for you before we put it out to the audience to ask some questions sure. as well. But you know, when you look at these different recommendations and the different pieces of legislation that were passed following the eye of the storm, what do you see as being the most difficult um, challenges in terms of implementing now that you're kind of moving on to the implementation phase? So it's, it's the two-edged sword. Um, we had support of the legislature to do a lot of things. We have a short period of time to do it. It takes a lot of work to do a lot of these uh, efforts that we have. And so that's probably the biggest challenge is if we had one charge together, uh, it would be easier to accomplish. But we have many, many charges that we have to do in a very short period of time. And as I said, what's, what's okay about that is they're not complete products. They're, in some cases, we're gonna study and then we'll take a next step. In other cases, it's beginning to end. In other cases, it's to seek advice and to bring new advisors into the work that we're already doing. Um, and so those challenges are gonna be hard. Uh, the next piece will be after we collect all of that, we do all of our work, is how do we distribute it? How do we pass it back out to people and, and uh, really keep the champions that we have today through the next legislative session and into the local jurisdictions and into the response agencies so they can see value of these recommendations and that we can perpetuate the next round of it. We have to keep it going. It's a hot topic right now. Every day that Harvey passes by, it fades a little bit further from our memory. We just had um, storms, significant storms here in Texas and while it comes up again, the le many of the lessons learned from back then are already kind of in the background and we have to bring them up again. So uh, I think keeping it current and keeping it fresh and keeping the championship nature behind our electeds and our um, professional responders and our emergency management community is gonna be the key. Thank you, thank you very much. Absolutely. So I'd like to give the audience a chance to ask a couple of questions. So do any folks have any questions for Josh and the experience they've gone through in Harvey? No questions. Oh, we see one right up here with Robert. Well, I think they're bringing a mic right now. So, so with the, the Lower Career, you know, not rebuilding ADA is a, is a became actually a very positive in terms of what it did with, within the community, you know, preparation. Right, that was a deep question by the way. Um, if you don't know much about that example, the 880 freeway in Northern California was a double-decker freeway that in the earthquake collapsed on top of itself and was built into, in a low socioeconomic environment. And so <clears throat> it caused a lot of blight when that impact happened and it was years and years and years of recovery into how you rebuild that, that area to maintain the infrastructure but also to care for the population that, that is there as well. Um, the 44 recommendations are so broad that I think you couldn't possibly do the work that we have to without considering 
the diversity that happens in all the 254 Texas counties. Uh, we go from extremes in what we have in our socioeconomic climate. The good thing is that um, there will likely always be sources of revenue and, and rebuilding piece from our federal partners. And so we don't wanna put that aside. That's, that's a quality piece of the pie. But I think our efforts is to really look at the engineering components of how we build communities. And codes and standards aside, that could be a local decision, that could be a state decision, it depends where you are. It's beyond codes and standards. It's mm -hmm. just from basic planning and involving the community and, and finding something that will bring the community and to help you do that planning. Because one of the things we see, as you know, is people who don't need training come to your training. People who don't need to be involved in local planning don't come to your planning efforts for a million different reasons. They feel disenfranchised for it, by it. So you have to find mechanisms by which to bring them in and try to solicit that. Otherwise, it's this person is doing what they think is best for another population that they've never sought feedback from. Um, so I would challenge the local jurisdictions to figure out how they can uh, activate that population to communicate because often it has to be a member of that community who is the one to to um, pioneer an idea or a concept and, and push it forward. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really interesting discussion. We have another question right up front. Daniel? Um, so in regards to the 44 recommendations that could be still signed by the governor, what is the most difficult or the hardest for you to implement and why? I think any of the recommendations that involve the activities of another partner and so FEMA is a prime example. While we can come up with a great case and we can talk about what Texas can do in our local jurisdictions, in some cases if uh, federal law doesn't change, we're stopped. And so it doesn't mean that we end our effort, it means that it changes from a practical application into more advocacy, into more political outreach, more involving associations and uh, building support for what that topic is. But no doubt is it um, that mix of not having authority and everything that you're, you're trying to do. Plus, as a state agency, as you know, it's, it's your mantra, it's our collective mantra. Everything is um, a local jurisdiction's responsibility, both in the planning phase and response through, through everything. And so the local jurisdiction has to be at the table too in not only wanting to participate, but seeing the value and then being an advocate for it. Thank the, you. The technical, the technical parts are the easiest because we have scientists, we have academics, we have practitioners, we can solve those problems. It's the softer side and the, the uh, communicating a real problem with a real solution that someone feels is actually gonna be a benefit to them rather than just a political initiative or checking a box. And we were having this discussion in a breakout session, it's that you know, how do you actually incentivize? And at the end of the day, it, we have to do things because it's what makes sense and what's better for our communities and our operations. Ultimately, it's not about grant funds. It's not about right. kind of these other carrots and sticks. And I think you know, getting that support at the local level is what's going to be your your success. Right. So it's exciting. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much, Josh. You're welcome. I really appreciate it, and I think you'll be around for a little I while. I will. Yes, and I'll stick around so in the back if anyone has any questions or. That would be wonderful. Chat. Yeah, thank you. And w w there'll be a break after the next disaster innovation talk. So I appreciate it. Okay, thank you so good. much. Thank you. Thanks.